Hey there, creative coders. This is Benjamin D. Whiting, and welcome back to the Super Collider segment of Null State's interactive digital art tutorial series. Last episode, I touched upon my intention of closing out this segment of our series with our first reactive electroacoustic soundscape, in addition to introducing the just in time programming library, JITLib. This time, we will engage in some rudimentary pre compositional planning, in addition to building our first complex sound for our project. Let's get started. Now that we've decided on the kind of project we wish to pursue, it is important that we engage in some pre-compositional planning so we don't waste time approaching our composition helter-skelter. As we will be sticking to a relatively simple piece for our first project, this step won't be as extensive as if we were composing a grand interactive electroacoustic work of art, but it nevertheless will pay dividends if we start getting ourselves into these habits as early as possible. First, we should decide on our project's scope. While our piece will be simple, we don't want it to be static or boring. It should come alive and excite our audience in some way. Therefore, we'll want our sound art composition to evolve over a period of time, let's say 10 to 15 minutes in length. Next, we need to set some ground rules on the extent of the interactivity of our piece. Eventually, any composer serious about electroacoustic composition will invest in their own battery of equipment for interfacing with their pieces and installations, but as this is an introductory tutorial, it's unreasonable to expect anyone to have specialized equipment on hand, so we'll stick to the usual keyboard and mouse combo. That said, at times I may make suggestions for those who might want to experiment with external devices like web cameras, game controllers, photoreceptive sensors, and so on. Once the scope of a project is decided on, it's time to tackle the main timbral characteristics of the piece, and experiment with sounds to achieve one's coloristic ideals. Entire college and university courses are taught on sound design. An exhaustive lecture on this topic would be entirely out of the scope of this tutorial and would derail it. Nevertheless, I will be walking through the composition of some of the sounds used in this project, the rest will be annotated on GitHub, for the remainder of these episodes. While this project is deemed a soundscape, I mean it in a general sense of it being sound art. It's not intended to simulate the sounds of some natural setting like a beach, forest, or creepy castle. Instead, think of it as a kind of morphing foundation upon which sounds react to user-provided stimuli, taking on lives of their own. For the most part, the sounds employed within this project will be the product of synthesis, be it additive, subtractive, granular, or some combination therein. We will start by devising sounds to be used as the bedrock of the piece, followed by one-shot gestures that manifest as reactions to user-provided stimuli. As many people watching the series may not yet have access to quality microphones, found sounds, that is, recordings of objects, anthropogenic or animalistic vocalizations, ambient sounds, and so on, will not be utilized, neither will live input from a microphone. That said, there will be a video detailing how to record and use sounds in one soundscape, as feeding sound into Super Collider is an important skill to learn for both signal fodder and signal control. Our first sound should be one that's rich, and that provides timbral and harmonic support for our piece. We'll use the VOSC3 UGen, a useful unit generator that combines three variable wavetable oscillators. How this UGen works is that it takes two or more buffers filled with wavetable data and crossfades between them. This is very useful when wanting to seamlessly add and subtract harmonic content from the resulting sound, and is much easier on the CPU, not to mention on one's sanity, than by manually setting up individual oscillators for each partial, as the lookup tables are already allocated into memory. The three oscillators are useful for adding timbral complexity to the outgoing signal. Let's boot the server. We will start by allocating and populating the buffers necessary to set up our waveforms, as well as filling them with said waveforms. While buffers will be discussed in much greater detail by the time we get to processing live microphone input, suffice to say for now that a buffer is a region of a computer's memory reserved for an application to read from and write to. It is much, much faster to store and access volatile data in RAM than in solid state drives and orders of magnitude faster than in traditional spinning drives. The VOSC3 help file has some great suggestions for waveforms to place in our buffers, and I'm rather fond of the following. So let's adapt the syntax a bit to conform to our normal usage and plonk it in.
Here we're setting up eight buffers. Within the array lies the wavetable's amplitude data. The first time through the do loop, the index will be zero, thus the array will have nothing filled in save for the concatenated 0.5, 1, 0 0.5. This ensures that the fundamental will be at half amplitude of the first overtone, and the second overtone will be expressed at the same amplitude of the fundamental pitch. This waveform will feature no further partials in the harmonic series. We then send an OSC message to the server through the dot send message instance method with the following instructions. Allocate a buffer via the b underscore alloc command. Give it the buffer ID matching the index of the wavetable, in this case ID zero, and make sure to reserve 1024 samples for the wavetable. Sample sizes must be in powers of two. Finally, we send another message to the server instructing it to fill a buffer using b underscore gen at the ID of the index number of the do loop zero with sine wave partials sine one, flagged with code seven, See the sign one entry in the server command reference for more details on what these flags do, using amplitude data found in the array A. The dot perform list instance method of servers used here as dot send message cannot embed collections into the OSC message. The next time through the loop, the index number will be one, leading to zero, 0 0.5, one, 0 0.5 as the array of amplitudes, and the ID of the buffer generated will also be one. This continues until all eight buffers are allocated and filled. Now that we have our wavetable data, we need to set up our node proxy containing our vosc3 synth. First, we are going to want to issue the instruction to play it, as proxy space requires dot play and the synth itself to be in separate instructions. We'll call it tilde ground for the time being, as this will act as the bedrock for the first section of our piece. Next, we'll define the synth that will be placed within tilde ground. Again, all of this will be subject to refinement later on, but for now, let's have the horizontal positioning of the mouse cursor determine the buffer ID of the wavetable, in our case, the spectral makeup of the sound, and the Y, the fundamental pitch content being sounded. We'll start by setting an argument controlling the buffer number offset. The significance of this will become clear momentarily. We will then set our mouse X variable to an instance of the mouse X uGen with a range of 0 to 7. This will allow us to move through all of the buffers we've allocated thus far. Mouse Y will be mapped from a fundamental frequency of 80 Hz to some multiple of 160 Hz. For now, we'll leave it at 160. We'll use name controls here. By the way, buff offset could also have been a name control, but it's unlikely it will ever be modulated while the synth is sounding, so a name control would be a waste of keystrokes, space, and CPU cycles. Let's now set up our vosc 3 uGen. To the buffer position argument, we'll set buff offset plus mouse X. Now we need to figure out what to do with our three oscillators. We'll set our first one to mouse Y, adding one hertz to the right channel's output, thus facilitating a beating or shimmering texture. For the second, we'll also set it to mouse Y, but map the output using dot exp exp, a convenience method that maps an exponential input to exponential output, so that the upper bound is twice above mouse Y's stated maximum. We'll continue manipulating the final frequency slightly to allow all oscillators to shimmer. We'll repeat this for the third oscillator, but have its upper bound four octaves above the fundamental. Finally, we set the amplitude to 20% of the maximum. Now let's play it. Neat. By the way, you may have been wondering what the second argument in our named controls is all about. It's the lag argument. While the word lag often has negative connotations in the English language, in SuperCollider it is a very useful tool. If one were to change the value of a name control to something else, the lag argument would delay the arrival at the new value by the number of seconds stated, during which SuperCollider will interpolate intervening values, thus smoothing the transition. To illustrate, Let's alter the fundamental frequency to 200 Hz. Now let's change the lag time to 10 seconds and change the frequency to 420 Hz.
Just so you are aware, the lag argument can itself be modulated externally by a named control. Next, let's introduce some random timbral variants. We'll accomplish this by combining an LF pulse UGen multiplicand with UGen.if. If the value returned by UGen.if can be rounded down to zero, then a non band limited pulse wave, oscillating at 440 Hz, the default value, and with variable width, will modulate the carrier signal. As you can hear, occasionally the signal sounds like it's being filtered through some sort of granulator with uneven panning. This is thanks to the pulse wave with variable width. Incidentally, lag is not reserved for name controls. One can easily wrap any UGen in a lag UGen by invoking its convenience method .lag. This is how we're getting a smooth one second transition in and out of the LF pulse modulated signal. Finally, let's add some more evolutionary content to our first sound. We'll add another VOSC3 UGen to our node proxy, which will require us allocating more buffers. Let's fill our wavetable with another function found in the VOSC3 help file, though we will need to adapt it somewhat to get it to work. First, we can't simply execute another do loop without adjusting the resulting index number somehow. If we did, we would end up overwriting the buffers we created for our initial VOSC3 UGen. We need to make sure that our new buffers are written to IDs 8 through 15. We do this by creating a new variable, let's call it new index, and setting it to i plus 8. We still use the unaltered i for filling the array with amplitude data, but new index will be called when allocating and filling the buffers themselves. Let's make one more change to the documentation's example by filling the amplitude array with all zeros if the buffer ID is 8, 9, or 10, in other words, less than 11. This will allow us to fade this second signal in once the mouse cursor crosses the point on the screen that would begin fading in the buffer with an ID of 11. For the intended transformation, we'll populate an array filled with lots of zeros at random with ones. If you're confused as to what the double greater than sign means, it's a bit shift operator that I'll explain in some future episode. Now that we have our 16 buffers filled and ready to go, it's time to expand our tilde ground node proxy. First, let's alter the fundamental frequency of our second VOSC3 UGen, though keep it linked to the first. We can use a second mouse y variable to accomplish this. Multiplying fund.kr by 5 will do the trick, as that will ensure it's roughly two octaves and a major third above our first signal's fundamental. We'll keep mouse y2 confined to an octave just like mouse y1, so its upper bound will be fund.kr multiplied by 10. Now, since the buffers for our second signal begin with an ID of 8, we'll need a second buff offset argument, so let's go ahead and add it. All that's left is to make some adjustments to the frequency content of SIG2, reduce the amplitude by half since we're dealing with higher frequency content and don't want it to overpower our lower pitch signal, and add SIG2 to SIG1 in our returned signal. Not bad! As we gradually bring in SIG2, it provides a nice crystalline texture. That said, I'm not a fan of it being modulated by the randomly manifesting pulse wave, so let's reverse the two operations. We now have an excellent contrast between the unpredictably corrupted nature of our first signal and a constant, untouched, ethereal sound with our second. Not a bad way to begin things! That's about it for this week's episode. Annotated code for the examples can be found on the series GitHub, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below, 
and I'll get to them as soon as I can. We will be engaging in some more sound design next time with focus on triggered one-shot sonic gestures. In the meantime, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel to show your support for more interactive digital music and art content from us at Null State. Also, make sure to check out our Facebook page and webpage to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events, workshops, and concerts. Links to all of these are in the description below. Happy coding!